This is a portrait of Charles Darwin in 1881, a year before his death, and it's based not only on the voyage of the Beagle and what came after, but also on the funny and charming and self-deprecating autobiography which he wrote for his children toward the end of his life. Darwin is portrayed here as the magician Prospero from Shakespeare's Tempest. Shakespeare seems to have been preoccupied intermittently with Ovid's metamorphoses, maybe ever since he was a schoolboy, but certainly from at least the early play Titus Andronicus until the late play The Tempest. And although, of course, Ovid has nothing to do with natural selection, still this vision of shape-shifting, which haunted Shakespeare, provides a background for some of this poem's life story parallels between Prospero, the imaginary 17th century magician, and Darwin, the real 19th century scientist. Both Prospero and Darwin traveled to the islands, which could be called enchanted islands, because there the supposed law of the fixity of species was broken or superseded. And there both Prospero and Darwin had visions of the metamorphoses of living creatures, as they both looked into what Prospero calls the dark backward and abysm of time. Both Prospero and Darwin withdrew from the world of society and politics into their studies, Prospero before his voyage and Darwin after his. Both began tempests with their books and expressed a yearning to throw their books overboard. And at the end, feeling themselves to be looking backward from the perspective of the grave, both expressed their urgent longing to tell the stories of their own lives. This poem begins after the tempest ends, and looks backward into the play. It begins with a sleepless night, one of many for Charles Darwin, since after the voyage of the Beagle, he suffered for the rest of his life from an undiagnosed recurring illness, the symptoms of which included vertigo and insomnia. Darwin in 1881. Sleepless as Prospero back in his bedroom in Milan, with all his miracles reduced to sailor's tales, he sits up in the dark. The islands loom. His seasickness upwells. Silence creeps by in memory as it crept by him on water while the sailors slept from broken eggs and vacant tortoise shells. His voyage around the Cape of Middle Age comes with a feat of insight to a close, the same way Prospero's ended before he left the stage to be led home across the blue-white sea when he had spoken of the clouds and globe breaking his wand and taking off his robe. Knowledge increases unreality. He quickly dresses. Form wavers like his shadow on the stair as he descends, in need of air to cure his dizziness, down past the ship-sunk emptiness of grown-up children's rooms and hallways where the family portraits stare, all haunted by each other's likenesses. Outside the orchard and a piece of moon are islands, he an island as he walks, brushing against weed stalks. By hook and plume, the seeds gathering on his trouser legs are archipelagos. Like nests he sees shadowed in branching, ramifying trees, each with unique expressions in its eggs. Different islands conjure different beings. Different beings call from different isles. And after all his scrutiny of nature, all he can see is how it will grow small, fade, disappear, a coastline fading from a traveler aboard a survey ship. Slowly, as coasts depart, nature had left behind a naturalist bound for a place where species don't exist, where no emergence has a counterpart. He's heard from friends about the other night, the banquet hall ringing with bravos, like a curtain call, he thinks, when the performance ends, failing to summon from the wings an actor who had lost his taste for verse, having beheld, in larger theaters, much greater banquet vanishings without the quaint device and thunderclap required in Act Three. He wrote, Let your indulgence set me free, to the Academy, and took a nap, beneath a London daily tent, then puttered on his hothouse walk, watching his orchids beautifully stalk their unreturning paths, where each descendant is the last, their inner staircases haunted by vanished insect faces so tiny, so intolerably vast. And while they gave his proxy the award, he dined in down 
and stayed up rather late for backgammon with his beloved mate who reads his books and is, quite frankly, bored. Now done with beetle jaws and beaks of gulls and bivalve hinges, now, utterly done, one miracle remains, and only one. An ocean swell of sickness rushes, pulls. He leans against the fence and lights a cigarette and deeply draws. Done with fixed laws, done with experiments within his greenhouse heaven where his offspring, Frank, for half the afternoon played like an awkward angel his bassoon into the humid air so he could tell if sound would make a Venus's flytrap close. And done for good with scientific prose, that raging hell of tortured grammars writhing on their stakes. He'd turn to his memoirs, chuckling to write about his boyhood in an upright home. A boy preferring garter snakes to schoolwork, a lazy strutting liar who quite provoked her aggravated look, shushed in the drawing room behind her book, his bossy sister itching with desire to tattletale. Yes, that was good. But even then, much like the conjurer grown cranky with impatience to abjure all his gigantic works and livelihood in order to immerse himself in tales where he could be the man, in Once Upon a Time there was a man. He'd quite by chance beheld the universe. A disregarded game of chess between two love-dazed heirs who fiddle with the tiny pairs of statues in their hands while numberless, abstract, unseen combinings on the silent board remain unplayed forever when they leave the game to turn themselves into a king and queen. Now, like the coming day, inhaled smoke illuminates his nerves. He turns, taking the sandwalk as it curves back to the yard, the house, the entranceway where, not to waken her, he softly shuts the door and leans against it for a spell before he climbs the stairs holding the banister up to their room. There Emma sleeps, moored in illusion, blown past the storm he conjured with his book into a harbor where it all comes clear, where island beings leap from shape to shape as to escape their terrifying turns to disappear. He lies down on the quilt, he lies down like a fabulous-headed fossil in a vanished riverbed, in ocean drifts, in canyon floors, in silt, in lime, in deepening blue ice, in cliffs obscured as clouds gather and float. He lies down in his boots and overcoat and shuts his eyes.